I'm encouraged, I think, by the cyber performance goals. And I think there's been some kind of some breadcrumbs dropped in some of these announcements by HHS that mm -hmm. those standards are eventually going to make their way into being this, the new security rule uh, under HIPAA, kind of the technologies that undergird the, the updated security rule. Yeah. Um, and I think what that would do is bring in the business associates, right? The vendors to covered entity healthcare providers because they're subject to the HIPAA security rule. Welcome to the Risk Never Sleeps podcast in which we talk to the folks on the front lines delivering and protecting patient care. Uh, we get to learn about their stories, and I am pleased to be joined again, once again, by my good friend, Phil Davis. And Phil is the healthcare IT, cybersecurity, and privacy attorney at Hall Render in Indianapolis. Did I get that correct? You did. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Awesome. How are you doing? Hey, Phil, good to see you, man. Thanks happy, for having me back. Happy That's Friday. Time, you right? Always a good time to talk to you. And, um... Yeah, happy Friday. Uh, any plans for the force? Uh, I think we're going to find some fireworks somewhere around town. That's usually the plan. You know, nice. let's let the dogs stay in the house and uh, uh, be, have a nice insulated fan noise. And yeah, calm while we go. While we go and white and noise for them to yeah to calm themselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, very good. Yeah, we're. I don't think we have any plans yet. So this is going to be a, we usually are on a, a boat heading up to Provincetown. Uh, they have an amazing uh, parade and a set of festivities, fireworks. Et I can imagine in the Northeast that, that they have quite a, quite a fine time on, on the July 4th holiday. That's kind of the, uh, the, the birthplace of July 4th, if you will. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And uh, it can get a little crazy there uh, for sure uh, with the festivities. So uh, always a good time now. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a little slice of Americana right there in Massachusetts. So uh, I personally love going. Uh, so I don't know if we're going to make it this year, but uh, you know, I'm still hopeful. All right. Well, let's get into it. Gosh, last time we spoke, I think a lot's happened, right? Change health. Essential uh, health. Um, yeah, there's certainly been no shortage of headlines. Uh, yeah, so kind of highlighting third-party risk and business continuity, and um, a lot of the things that we we talk about a lot, right? I mean, and it just co goes to show that none of this is solved yet. None of it's solved. And why do you think that? I mean, I mean, I have my my theory, but what what's your theory on that? Well, I'd, I'd love to hear your theory, but you know, I especially in healthcare, right? I think we talked about this maybe in the first the first time I was on the show and healthcare is so complicated and so complex in terms of the number of outside vendors and the number of advanced, really advanced technologies that are all pieced together and constructed to deliver what we call the healthcare service, right? Like healthcare really, if you, if you zoom out, is just a collection of vendors that a healthcare provider has assembled in such a way that allows its employees to provide care services. You've got medical devices, you've got software, you've got in some cases staff, right? Outsourced staff that comes in. And with all of that just comes at an, an incredible amount of complexity and an incredible amount of an attack surface and risk and Healthcare is just so hard to guard from all angles. And I think you that that's how you see just so many of these large scale attacks happening is a lot of times it's a vendor that's getting the attack, right? In the change healthcare situation, or you know, a potential vendor solution that you use to either secure your environment or deliver care that takes down your own internal systems. And so it's just this patchwork of advanced technologies that has a lot of capability, but also just leaves a lot of risk by definition with it in healthcare that I think creates this environment that is really just ripe to be disrupted in a, in a negative way. Yeah, great, great points. So there's this yin and yang of good and evil that exists in everything. And so you've got this tension between, I want to 
innovate. I want to drive innovation. I want to drive growth in my organization. I want to do the right thing for patients and outcomes. I want them to have the best experience. I want them to come back when there are issues, et cetera, with the challenges and risks associated with um, disruptive technology. And, and, and specifically, I mean, if you look back a decade or so ago, this wasn't that big of an issue because most of that technology was contained and constrained within the four walls of the health system. Exactly. You didn't have the remote, you didn't have the work from home, exactly. you know, windows that needed to be opened up, the remote access, right? That if you can access your internal resources from anywhere. Well, is that a good idea in a lot of cases? Maybe, maybe not, but you're right. 10 years ago, yeah. you know, when I was a CISO in an organization, 10 years ago, we couldn't get to our email without the VPN on, right? Right. Right. That concept is kind of gone for the most, right? You can, everything's in the cloud and, and widely accessible. Right, right. In in the notion of applications and the way that they're developed, there used to be this, you'd have this monolithic on-premise application that did, you know, the majority of the things you needed. And now it's distributed across several SaaS applications. So you got this sense of micro services and micro business processes now that are being driven through automation and technology which yeah. in the past, you know, didn't really exist. And so this notion of things that, you know, we used a decade ago to manage risks like certificates, you know, like tend to be outdated in so much as things change so often, you need to take much more of a, a continuous and more dynamic approach to monitoring risk. And I think that adds to the complexity, obviously, because... Absolutely. And and you can't throw out, you know, the, the threat actors, right? They... <laughs> They have certainly advanced their tactics and obviously the uh, kind of advent of ransomware and that concept of creating the most amount of destruction possible in the target environment, um, you know, really makes things difficult in the healthcare setting because our, our bar in healthcare is so high in terms of what we're willing to withstand in order to still provide care. And it just makes that pain point so much higher. And so when you reach that level, right, when an attacker has, has gotten into that, to, to that degree, you now have a whole lot of pain that, that, that you're having to withstand because your bar was so high, right? We're a critical infrastructure service. We're a service that society needs to have performed. And, you know, all of that comes together to create that perfect storm, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right, exactly. And so as we receive technology and innovation to do things better, faster, cheaper, et cetera. They also get the benefit of technology and they're leveraging technology, obviously for the wrong reasons. Um, and also the fact that they can hide now, um, right? Dark web, um, you know, the ability to basically disappear and be anonymous um, also drives to that level of complexity uh, from not only managing the attacks, but catching the attackers. And then lastly, they become much more organized. So um, they've realized that they could also create these microservices, if you will, <laughs> for things like ransomware, where you know one person or entity goes and collects the money while another one does the attack, while another one communicates, right? Et cetera. So it's- I, I, continue, I continue to be amazed at so now, having been in, in the cybersecurity kind of attorney role and dealing with ransomware incident response and the negotiations that you have with these attackers, I continue to be amazed at the level of customer service and sophistication of some of their operations, right? You know, they have literal teams in the same way that a healthcare system might have teams of, you know, you got supply chain people, you've got purchasing, you've got sales people, you've got... You know, they, they've kind of stood up a lot of that same infrastructure and have processes even and standards built up about what we're willing to offer and what we're not going to offer. And it, it's just the, the, the world has evolved so much, you know, which is where, where, where we started with this conversation just to um, – it, it, it's gone where the where the incentive is, mm. unfortunately, yeah. right? Yeah, and, it always goes where the money is, right? <laughs> as long as people are paying ransoms, um, you know, it's that never-ending debate. But as long as people are paying and there's a revenue stream uh, for those nefarious individuals, unfortunately, I think that's what you're going to continue to see. 
Yeah, it's the it's the old Willie Sutton adage, right? Um, or Rob Banks, because that's where the money is. It's where the money is. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, I think we hammered that topic. So um, let's, let's talk about how to manage some of this. Yeah, risk. let's talk about how to manage it, and then we'll we'll get into some new technology. So. White House um, administration has been doing a lot, been very active in this area, um, driving regulations, uh, accelerating the rulemaking process when it comes to the cybersecurity performance goals. You know, what's the latest update from your perspective there? Yeah, I think I, so. It's actually, in D.C. within the last month or so, and got to meet with um, Representative Bouchon, who's from here in Indiana, and uh, this was kind of in the heat of the of the change healthcare hearings and you know, all of the the various revenue impacts that the government was having to step in and help with. Um, so obviously this came up, right? And, um, you know, I think the feedback that we're getting from the Hill is that there is a lot of appetite for creating increased standards, let's say, for minimum cybersecurity requirements. Now, that could look a lot of different ways, right? Whether it's a carrot or it's a stick, I think is still kind of up in the air. Um, I, I continue to think that there is a lot of value in creating some sort of a meaningful use type of incentive for where you can demonstrate that you have multi-factor authentication in place, you know, for remote access or, you know, critical application access, whatever that standard, you know, that and agree to set is if we can set some sort of meaningful use like incentive program to where you get either dollars back or, uh, you know, maybe that's dollars for setting up that technology on the front end versus, you know, the the HIPAA model of, well, you get punished if you don't have. Yeah. 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 And, and have have the ONC, which is really good at the sort of certification process, obviously, through meaningful use, have them administer that as well. Oh, right. Oh, I, I think there, I think there is some appetite for that. Um, you know, the feedback that that we got is that that's very expensive, and I, I certainly am, yeah, and am understanding that. But I think there's a there's a critical mass of incidents that really have driven the conversation there in terms of, okay, well, how how do we as an industry and government plays a role, certainly, um, how do we all collectively as an industry come up with with an acceptable method of ensuring that our healthcare data is minimally protected by certain technologies. And I, I, I like all, I, I like the cyber performance goals. I like, you know, hiccup the standards that, that uh, four or five D group is coming out with. I think these are all really great, um, really great ways to get that conversation going to, to collectively decide what are those standards are. Because at the end of the day, we do need to decide what the technologies uh, need to be and how they should be implemented. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the economics right behind that. that. Yeah, and the economics behind that too, because as you, as you stated, it can be very expensive for these smaller rural critical access hospitals to meet that meet those standards. Um, mm -hmm. You know, given that every dollar, you know, is is they manage like manhole covers, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I, it's so true. And we we've seen you know kind of a little bit of drippings. From that, right? I think there was a fifty million dollar fund that was announced for rural healthcare entities to invest in uh, improve cybersecurity. That's kind of obviously maybe a little bit of a drop in the bucket, but it could be a, a good test case on how do we distribute these dollars and what's the audit and compliance angle that needs to be there to ensure that those dollars are being used appropriately, right? I think that's hopefully kind of a test case of how. We could we could step in to start helping rural facilities because you're right, those are the facilities that probably have the most roadblocks to getting these things in place. Yeah. yeah, and be deliberate and purposeful on on how we help them achieve those essential and um, ultimate enhanced cybersecurity performance goals. Um, because you know, again, if we uh, and, and and then also that's only half of the problem, right? The other half exists outside of the four walls. It's the third parties. And right now the third parties even aren't, aren't even brought into that conversation. No. How, 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 you know, what's your, what's your thinking on that? What do you think? You know, I, I'm encouraged, I think by the cyber performance goals. And I think there's been some kind of some breadcrumbs dropped in some of these announcements by HHS that, 
those standards are eventually going to make their way into being the, the new security rule uh, under HIPAA, kind of the technologies that undergird the, the updated security rule. Yeah. Um, and I think what that would do is bring in the business associates, right? The vendors to covered entity healthcare providers because they're subject to the HIPAA security rule uh, the same way that providers are. So I think if they can if they can develop those standards into, obviously it's hard to scale that, right? To all entities throughout the, the nation. But I think that work has started. And I think that that kind of evolution of the security rule will help get the industry as a whole that's holding protected health information to include cover entities and business associates. I think that would, would go a long way to kind of creating that incentive program. That obviously exists within within the HIPAA infrastructure, and so you have, you know, a little bit more stick, you know, instead yeah. of there than carrot um, in, in a mechanism that's that's already in place that you know you can um, just uh, append to. Exactly, exactly. But I think that the the writing is kind of on the wall, though, that, that we are going to get updated security rule technology standards, and it's going to be less what I've talked about in the past, where it's kind of a nebulous requirement that you you're left to de- to determine what works for you and it's going to be a little bit more prescriptive from a technology perspective that's great um you know in your role you get visibility into a number of health systems and what they're doing and what their priorities are what are you seeing in terms of patterns of priority over the next 12 months for health systems yeah it, i think in terms of kind of this third party risk there uh, there has been a concerted uh, i want to say refocus on the third party risk policies and procedures and what what customers in the health so the covered entities right yeah. whose phi that, you know that that the, all of this data is it belongs to the customers here what they're willing to accept you know in, in contractual uh settings and kind of creating some some of their own standards about, hey, we're going to require that a vendor has at least this minimum level of technical control in place. And we're going to need them to you know, commit to that in a security addendum or something like that. Um, so that's kind of on the one side of things, the contractual side. But there's also very real process improvements that are happening on the third party risk side. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had conversations with clients recently, several conversations kind of on the theme of let's really think about why do we have a third party risk program? Why do we do that? Right. Because after change healthcare, they obviously had, you know, massive operational impact because of a vendor's event. And so that, that, I think that makes you question, well, why am I doing these third party risk assessments if I can't prevent an attack in my vendor's environment? Right. Right. I'm curious to hear what they said, because again, I, I have, I have my own thoughts on this topic. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, every organization I think approaches that a little bit differently. There, there's several buckets I think of incentives and goals of the third party risk program. At the top of the list, generally is well, we're required to do risk assessments by you know HIPAA, for example. You have to assess your risk, and you know our patients and our customers expect that of us the regulators expect that of us they expect us to do appropriate due diligence when we're engaging and so it's kind of a little bit of a standard of care um that gets you in the door right but then i think that there's other benefits of doing that outside of i'm trying to prevent all cyber attacks in my vendors i don't yeah. think that's a reasonable goal you know of your of your traditional risk assessment process um Short, short of going in and taking over their sock or, you know, putting your <laughs> putting your equipment in their environment, which is probably not going to fly um, with most vendors. But short of that, I think your risk assessment process can can uncover certain things that you can then handle in a contractual negotiation. Right. You could say, hey, we found a certain number of red flags, if you will, in our risk assessment. So we want to have some contractual coverage, yeah. whether that be, you know remuneration from a business impact standpoint, it gives you more leverage to have those conversations yeah. you know, under data. Um, so that's a still a real benefit of the third party risk process. Um, and I still continue to think that the, the rising tide has lifted all boats in the industry. Story point, you know, the, that obligation 
that a vendor takes on also is going to make them better for the next customer that they work with because their program will have matured based on the feedback of the prior. Uh, yeah. And I, I tend to think that all vendors in the healthcare space now are very used to getting these questionnaires or at least some manner of third party risk assessment and vetting. Yeah. And that's caused the vendor community, right, to collectively ensure that they have answers to those questions when they get them. And I think that has is that rising tide from a security perspective that has helped, you know, bolster the industry. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a uh, kind of communal benefit uh, that we're all doing these uh, cyber assessments more than just, hey, it helps our own organization, you know, meet our requirements. It also helps the community as a whole lift its level of of uh, practice. Yeah, yeah. No, that 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 that's a great point. I think on the um, change health side of the world, um, you know, it was um, you know the question about well, we did all this work. How come we didn't see it? How come we couldn't prevent it? Because it was different than every other type of assumed attack or threat that you were dealing with. And I think the learning when I when I, I talked to several health systems during the you know the time of the attack, and I kept hearing this repeatedly, uh, the biggest learning is we were surprised. We had no idea the level of concentration that change had within our organization for a critical business process. And, Absolutely, and, yeah. and so I, and the fact that you know the other the other thing you're exposed is the amount of cash on hand these health systems had to be able to weather that storm of that event. Um, so I think that was a wake up call for organizations to start to look at that concentration and develop business continuity and disaster recovery plans that include alternatives. So if I do have that concentration for the right reasons, efficiencies or the wrong reasons that happened to me because they acquired a bunch of customers and companies, and I lost sight of that, right? I always thought it was distributed and then I blink and it's not. It's all coming through one organization, which is now part of a larger organization uh, or two steps removed from where I thought it was. So so I think that that, again, goes to the dynamism of this problem and the complexity of this problem. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I, I agree with that. And I don't think, you know, organizations should be too hard on themselves or their teams for exactly. necessarily missing that one. Right. I think exactly. the change scenario was such a it was so unique in that to, to, to what you just mentioned. I think that they amassed such control kind of under the radar a little bit. Right. It, I don't know that your regular health system really realized that that was such a single point of failure in the whole system. Yeah. Um, it's not like they necessarily signed, you know, some contract to be exclusive for all of their, you know, claims processing. Generally, they, they you know, thought that they had many different organizations that these things were routing through. Yeah. Uh, but turns out kind of with acquisitions and things, they didn't. Right. 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 Um, and so every now and then you get an you get an event like that that shakes the whole industry, and it's not necessarily something that someone missed necessarily. And I think this is where the federal government can step in a lot of a lot of yeah. time, yeah, and help provide some guardrails and some controls around that concentration of power. Um, but all that to say, you know, when you when you're going through your business continuity plans, I think that highlights a lot of that expanded business scope that we've been talking about, you know, in the IT and security community for years, that this is much more than an IT problem is you, you're, you're talking about going to days cash on hand, right? How many business continuity tabletops up to that point had considered what's our cash on hand. Right. Um, and so you learn things as you go, as you go through these events, um, certainly. And it's not necessarily about, you know, Hey, we missed this. We have something wrong. It's about let's take the right lesson from this and also then try and extrapolate a little bit and take the next step down the line of where else do we have single points of failure like this 
Yeah. I think a lot of organizations have a single point of failure with their supply chain purchasing, right? They'll have durable goods, hard, you know, kind of like that hardware equipment supplier, medical supply supplier that they buy the vast majority of, of their medical equipment through things yeah. like right? and gloves and gowns and things like that. You know, what are their backup processes there? Um you know, kind of going down the line and saying, how can we take this concept that we La now laundry service, right? If I have laundry, laundry service. service that can handle my health system because of the size and that gets hit, what happens? Because I can't operate a hospital without the spine. Yeah, exactly. One, one exercise that we've recommended um, organizations go through is take literally take a your 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 purchasing department should be able to pull you a list of your spend, right? With with vendors, sort it by dollars. That gives you a very, you know, kind of critical list of vendors at the top of that list where you can think through, okay, if they go down, what's my backup vendor? What's my, you know, maybe two or three other vendors that I can reach out to, to, to make up if, if something happens with these, you know, top five dollar amount spend types of vendors. And so we recommended that as a piece of your business continuity planning to just get some other ideas of where this may come up and bite you. And how, how to be a little bit more prepared for it. I love that. That's great advice to listeners too. So hopefully there are, a lot of folks are listening to this, this podcast in particular. Um, let's switch. Let's talk about AI, my favorite topic. I'm sure yours too. <laughs> what are you seeing from a, uh, from a governance pattern, from an adoption pattern? Um, how are your customers or folks that you talk to thinking about AI or, or actually implementing some type of cybersecurity program or governance around AI. Yeah. Um, so maybe start with the governance piece. I think generally most organizations have started at least, if they haven't published one, they've started, you know, drafting their AI governance policy. Mm -hmm. And some of the decisions you have to make when you're going through that is, you know, do I block certain AI tools, like kind of the public, do I block those or do I allow them and just communicate training out to my organization? You, you know, you don't put some sensitive data in here, or do you want to take maybe the more restrictive approach and, and block them and kind of whitelist them if there's a business case, things like that. Those are the types of kind of practical decisions that I think organizations are, are fighting through in those governance policies. Obviously, you need to have a solid data governance uh, and data classification procedure in order to pull this off, right? Because all of this is about what kind of data are you comfortable with your thousands of employees putting into these tools? And so if you have data classification already uh, to a point where you, you, you can classify your data, it makes that much easier, right? You can say no classified, no uh, private data, only public, right? For example, um, so that's another kind of trend area. Uh, there, there's various degrees of maturity regarding data classification because it's a very hard, admittedly, a very difficult um, concept to operationalize and it takes a long time. Yeah. Uh, well, it doesn't, I don't think it takes a long time from a, from a strategic framework perspective. It's the going and finding and then labeling the data that's more difficult right yeah. it's more <laughs> it's Emailed like you, it. can, yeah. you can set the framework to say data that is looks like this is classified this way and so <laughs> like you know you use your best judgment initially but then if we want to automate it and really drive the inspection of it that's the hard part i think absolutely it's the communication to your organization that hey we have this new scheme Mm -hmm. data classification. And here's the examples. And here's how you know when you're looking at a piece of data or a document, right. what you do with it based on this, right? And there's, there are, your, you're right, technologies that can help you crawl your file shares and your Office 365 environment and automatically apply. And, you know, that's obviously probably the preferable way to go, but that's not cheap. Um, and, you know, there, there's a runway there in terms of deploying tools like that. But it does certainly have a tie into this AI conversation. Um, I think it was the original point, but uh, in terms of how organizations are implementing AI, there's obviously it, it's a lot of vendor driven product conversations in terms of, Hey, this, this tool we've already been using now has an AI component. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the MR, uh, 
you know, maybe it's the dictation platform, right? You know, these vendors that you already have in place now has this AI capability. All right, well, let's, you know, kind of perform this new risk analysis and risk assessment on this new functionality and see maybe if we can deploy it in a limited set to start testing it out. Yes. Uh, Seeing a lot of that. There's a lot of contract issues that take place when you're purchasing these AI tools like data training and data ownership. And um, that's from the legal side of things, how we kind of get into the weeds and in the AI conversations. But, you know, I think vendors understand a lot of these risks and have been willing to work through a lot of the organization's concerns in terms of if I put data into your platform, we have a BAA in place and, you know, we know you're required to protect that data, but AI has got a mind of its own, right? In today's day and age, how do yeah. we ensure that that data is not going to be churned out to somebody else, right? Who's not able to see it. Um, so that's a lot of the conversations. And do you think this is a, a problem? Um, and if so, you know, how do how do health systems manage this um, as it relates to legacy vendors and products that you're working with and them bringing in AI capabilities through updates or patches and maybe not being as visible um, to the organization that that's occurred. Have you seen that? And have you seen policies or governance um, associated to to manage for that? Yeah, I, that's a that's a great point because I think that that does happen, right? In a SaaS kind of an environment where you're receiving an update automatically, and now there's oh, whoops, there's a new generative AI, yeah, you know, tab in my Adobe, Adobe like that. that. Adobe did it recently with with exactly PDF. right, and it was nefarious the way they managed it. I couldn't believe it. Like, you know they 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 kept throwing up the banner. They wouldn't allow you to say no, and then eventually they just accepted it in the application directly, which I thought, you know, which is so. So I think, you know, as we think about government um, regulations, um, these things need to be considered too because vendors should not be doing this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I. When I was assisted, there was a number of situations where it was kind of like some a call to the help desk really kind of <laughs> was the flag that yeah. you SaaS tool. I have this button, uh, you know, what does it do or something like that, right? And that <laughs> alerts you to, well, okay, well, there's an a change that happened over yeah. the air without me being able to vet it, press right. the button to go live, you know, um, you know, and and I think there's some vendor relationship management kinds of things that that need to take place there. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly, yeah, that's a. Maybe, if you're at the contracting phase, you can yeah, step great. in a little bit, a little I bit of that. Agree. But to your point, yeah. these are vendors that have been in place for ten yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. Years. But but to renewals, you get renewals that are coming up. So as you know, as you take an opportunity to renew, um, you know, make sure that you're building that language into the contract. Right. Um, if you're doing reassessments, make sure you're asking the question, right. How do you manage right. that? Or have you already done it to us and we just don't know about it? Um, right. right. You know, and, and, and your lawyers, I'm sure, can go back at the contract and probably find some ways that, that that's yeah. already addressed in the documents yeah. that you have, like maybe as confidential information or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but by the point that you're talking to a lawyer about it, right, something's already happened, right? So yeah. I think there's a little bit more proactive actions that that organizations can do just in their regular roundings with their with their vendors and ensuring that they know what's coming up that they you know they know how how the system deploys updates and you know that they make it known that you know we have certain standards here um well you work with us and generally vendors kind of are are cooperative at that stage right once we're talking to, to all the lawyers to look at the contracts things have generally gone you know a little bit sour mhm yeah um this is great. I, I have a couple more questions for you. I'd like, I'd love you to put your, your, your attorney hat on for a second. Um, you know, are you seeing a rise in these class action suits related to data breaches? Yes. Uh, I think that's an unequivocal. Yes. It, it's, it seems like there's, you know, there's a certain section of the plaintiff's bar that just watches for headlines and then starts drafting, get, gets in Word right away and copies their last <laughs> class action suit and pastes it into a new document. Find and replace, you know, the organization names. It's kind of funny. It, t- to be honest, we have seen several initial, 
you know, complaints for data breach cases that have mentioned other hospitals and other health systems that, you know, are not associated with the with the instant case. It kind of just indicates that there's a very quick trigger finger right now yeah. on data breach headlines. It kind of almost will automatically, to a certain degree now, triggers, you know, a suit and you'll get three, four, five of them right out of the gate. And it just, um, you know, it it's kind of a shame in one in one run respect because the, the the cases are not obviously very informed at that point. There's incorrect information in the complaint. And it just it creates a, a real overhead burden of now having to go fight that from the organization's yeah. perspective to say, hey, paragraphs nine through 15 are are you know factually incorrect. And then you have to argue about that and um do motion play. So from just from the litigation cost perspective, it it certainly um, can be significant. Um, we've seen a lot of insurance influence in terms of how those cases uh, may, you know, obviously the settlement conversations are generally, um, insurance has a role to play there. But to, to answer your question, I think when you do announce kind of your, your, your regular data breach as a result of a malicious attacker, we are seeing almost an immediate, you know, filing of a handful of cases. And what's it for the plaintiff? Like how much are these individuals getting on, in some of these uh, cases? To be honest, it's, it, it's a little bit to be determined, um, right? Because I think a lot of these suits, their their challenge is, have you stated sufficient damages in your claim, right? Have you, as the plaintiff, have you been able to demonstrate that you were harmed, right? And in a lot of those instances, you know, they may get nothing, right? They 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 may get the suit thrown out. And we've seen, you know, certainly a lot of cases where that's happened, where after, you know, a year of uh, litigation and motion practice and discovery back and forth, you know, gets thrown out and they, and they get nothing. Um, I think it's lawyers general, always end up getting more, right? Well, and, and that's the that's the truth, right? And I think that's why you see a lot of the the plaintiffs bar jumping at these opportunities is because they may get a class of two hundred thousand people. Everybody gets, you know, four dollars and thirty eight cents. But you know, the 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 attorneys that are working the case they get thirty three percent or you know forty percent, whatever the the thing is. And so I think there's a lot of incentive right now um, with those you know settlements that do happen. Uh, before they ever get to a trial, right? If you're getting a settlement, I think that's always the goal with these, you know, yeah. plaintiff suits is to get a settlement and then to take a cut of it, right? And it's just kind of the incentive structure that's kind of been built up around these data breaches. And there are some states that are obviously trying to thwart this um, with um, with their own efforts. Um, there's a the Senate Bill uh, 2018 20818 um, that is also trying to prevent these class action suits without willful or um, gross negligence, which I think is good. Should we have a national amnesty program or immunity program for folks that are doing the right thing by actually reporting the breaches, but then are getting, um, obviously, um, you know, getting challenged with, with the effort to respond to these class actions? Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Uh, I think it, it gets back to that initial conversation, I think, that we had about what are the minimum, you know, what what's the minimum standard of care that you should employ as a healthcare organization from a security perspective? And if you're doing those things, if you're doing what we as an industry have said is the minimum, yeah. um, you know, should you be held accountable, right, for something that happens while you were doing what you were supposed to do? Uh, you know, and I don't know that we could get there necessarily from the national legislative standard states, you know, may be able to carve some things into their data breach laws or consumer data privacy laws. Um, but these, these cases are generally very creative about how they use state laws to leave their claims in the court, right? These are generally, they're, they're not citing HIPAA other than as kind of the the, the duty that, you know, was there, right? Because HIPAA does not have the private cause of action part. So these are generally state law claims that are being asserted. And, you know, three or four of them will get thrown out. But every now and then you'll have one that, that may stick, right? In a certain yeah. circumstance. Yeah. And, 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 and the dirty little secret is um, 
there's a, a single click fragility, the whole house of cards, right? It only takes one user to click on that link, right? You could do all the training in the world. You'd be doing all the right things. And, and that attack, that phishing attack is so well done at that moment in time that that click happens and then everything comes tumbling down. Yeah, absolutely. And I, this is something that I, you know, tried to think through, obviously when I was in the CISO role and still, still try and help clients walk through is there is that one click, but generally there are three or four layers behind that click, right? That, that may have failed or may have, you know, were just weren't in place, right? Things like URL filtering or, um, you know, all, all of the various kinds of technologies that you can put in place to anticipate that someone's going to click. Yeah. There's probably a patch that's missing somewhere along that chain that allows, you know, that in the background executable uh, to happen, right? The, the, it's that click, but there's so much behind it. Your patching program, your, you know, the various firewalling technologies that you have. I mentioned URL filtering, right? Are, there's so many layers that you can think through in terms of, I know someone's going to click. What can I do to prevent that click from having the impact? And it goes all the way down to data segmentation and the blast radius <laughs> and things like that, right? It just gets so deep. And that's that healthcare um, and really any modern enterprise environment problem of one little thing can trigger and be associated with 15 other you know, actions and systems. And so understanding your entire attack surface is a really difficult thing to do, but something that I think is, is a key part of a security program. Yeah. And managing this healthy level of paranoia about everything. <laughs> you, you don't have to worry about that in, in the security community. I don't think. Oh, no, no. But, but just outside of it, I think it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's transitioned to um, and transcended um, to the house, right? To the home. And, yes. you know, we come home and we sort of take, you know, we take a deep sigh of relief that, you know, it didn't happen on our watch, but then we come home and, you know, it's still happening, right? You get kids yeah. and the parents and, you know, spouses that um, may or may not have that maturity of, of cyber that we have. And, um, and then you're dealing with it, you know, um, during your off, off hours. If that even exists, I don't think it exists actually in the cyber world, does it? <laughs> Notion of off hours. I always, tell, I always tell people, keep your phone next to your bed. <laughs> it's 24-7. It's healthcare. Risk never sleeps, right? Risk never sleeps. It's the name of the show and it's uh, it's the name of the game, I think, too, for, right. for a lot of us in, in, in the arena. That's right. Well, Phil, as always, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to catch up and talk to you. Um, wish you the best on the 4th of July weekend. Um and we will talk soon. This is Ed Gaudet from the Risk Never Sleeps podcast. If you are on the front lines delivering patient care and protecting patient safety, remember to stay vigilant because they're out there, Phil. Those hackers are out there. Risk never sleeps.